Today, the world continues to grapple with the coronavirus disease and its impact on many, including children. In Uganda, millions of children have had their learning interrupted because of school closures. Many say this is a dead year for school. But regardless of when school resumes, what is the safest way to protect our children from coronavirus when school resumes without a vaccine? And how vulnerable are they? You know, you can see them struggling, you know, with wanting to hug you, but you're like, please don't hug me, let me first wash my hands. I speak to Dr. Sabrina Chitaka, a pediatric infectious diseases specialist and senior lecturer in the Department of Pediatrics at Makere University School of Medicine. This podcast is produced with support from the East African Center for Investigative Reporting. My name is Kanara Mugumi, NBS TV's chief coronavirus correspondent, and this is the CoronaCast, questions and answers. The, the, the biggest worry right now is so schools are not yet open and they are thinking of reopening schools. But the biggest worry for the parents is can I let my child go out there in the open um, even when they are six years and above and they can wear a mask, there's no guarantee that they can keep their mask on, they can observe social distancing like adults do. So what do we know so far about coronavirus and children as we speak right now? First of all, we need to describe um, not just coronaviruses but SARS-CoV-2 which causes COVID-19. And yes, we know that since its inception and the pandemic, so many children have actually been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Fortunately, not many children get severe symptomatic disease. And we do know that even for the large numbers of patients who have fallen sick, let's say in the United States, only 7% of patients with COVID-19 are children below the age of 18. In Uganda, the current statistics show that nearly 90 children have fallen sick. This is between the age of 1 and 19 years. And they fall sick because their parents are sick or they are contacts of contacts. We haven't had any death from a child in Uganda, but there have been some deaths in other places. There have been deaths of children in Wuhan. There have been deaths of children in the United Kingdom, the youngest of whom was 12. And for me, that is concerning as a parent, but also as a pediatrician. So th there was a case where a child was sick, but then when they tested the father, mm -hmm. who apparently was working or doing some business around the border with Uganda and Kenya, mm -hmm. the father was not sick, and then the mother was not sick. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you explain such a thing as a scientist? So, Canary, that case caused a lot of controversy, even for us as scientists. But you need to understand that sometimes there are false positives. For example, if, if you got um, regular influenza virus or other coronaviruses, you could become positive on an antibody test. However, what we are doing right now in this country is the PCR test, which is more sensitive, and so we are not getting many false positives. That was a curious case of a child who was, you know, nine months was positive and then was negative, so I, I really wouldn't like to discuss that child. Okay, so we know coronavirus kills, and mm -hmm. so far we've just had a number of deaths. How come there are no children dying? I'm not saying that children should be dying, but mm -hmm. how does SARS explain the fact that children are actually not dying for now? Okay. And, and yet we consider children as one of the most vulnerable group of, of human beings. Exactly. We, we also know that coronavirus is a novel virus and the way it's behaving is really hurting people who have comorbid conditions, particularly hypertension, obesity and diabetes. And not many children have those comorbid conditions. For the children I described earlier on who died, they did have comorbid conditions like asthma. One child was extremely obese. And so, and then one child was even normal, no comorbid conditions. So it depends on the, the viral load that infects you. It also depends on the underlying disease that a child may have. Most children are healthy, but also what we need to know is maybe children are not getting big loads of, of the virus, as it were. There are community mitigations that have been put in place, like the school closures, like ensuring um, social distancing and washing hands, etc. So my suspicion is that not many children are getting engaged or involved in the places where there's high morbidity for COVID-19. However, 
what we know today as scientists is that when children also get um, asymptomatic disease and you measure their viral loads, they're extremely high, just like adults. So there's something that children have that is protecting them from getting the disease. When you look at the population of children in Uganda who have gotten COVID-19, the male-female ratio is exactly the same. It's one to one. So it's not choosing boys or girls, it's the same. But children are asymptomatic. Maybe for me, what I would think is because they have less non-communicable diseases. And now that science believes that there's a thing protecting the children, but they still cannot explain it, would you say then it is safe for the reopening of schools? Is, is it something that you as a scientist would recommend? Or then people who are below the age of, let's say, uh, 15 and have other diseases in their respiratory organs then would suffer the most. W what would be your opinion on that? You see, we don't know, we don't have clear statistics of children with non-communicable diseases in our country. We have a few, but it's not the entire uh, population that has been described. Mm -hmm. We know that there are a couple of um, children who have immunosuppression, there are over 5,000 children with diabetes. There are some children with sickle cell anemia. And potentially, those could be the children who could be most affected. Right now, the children are at home. They are protected. But if you put them in a pool where they have high risk of transmission, then it is those children who have the vulnerabilities that may succumb. So. Schools cannot close forever. Eventually, they'll have to reopen. And why I'm using schools a lot is because it is one community where children are out of home and they're mixing with other children from different communities. Mm -hmm. And you never know where these other children ha have been or who they have been in contact with. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what is the best way to protect them while they are at school? Fine, SOPs can be observed before entering school. They can wash their hands. But is that enough? No, it's not enough. And for me, the, the biggest comfort I'll ever get if we are to send our children back to school is if there's an available vaccine. For now, there's no vaccine. We are using protective measures like wearing a mask and ensuring social distancing. I've seen um, stories of places where schools have opened, like in Singapore and in China, but the social distancing is extremely serious. Canary, I don't know if our country can afford to put glass, you know, glass partitions in the classes because we have a huge population of children. We are not yet there. In South Africa, when they opened the schools, a hundred children were sick within two weeks. And so they had to rescind their decision and close the schools. Even in the US, schools have opened for, for the fall including universities, particularly universities. But if you count the Ivy League universities, um, the nine or so of them, over a thousand children have fallen sick. And then, because children are likely to be asymptomatic, and we know that in our setting, they are, you know, not every child is in a boarding school. So there will be those children who will have to go back and forth from school to home, and it's the grandparents. It's the parents with comorbid conditions who are going to fall sick by children who are spreaders and they are not symptomatic. So the fear continues to linger on. Yes, we want our children to go back to school. We believe the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education has prepared SOPs but will we be able to follow them to the dot? And yes, this can be done for boarding schools. They behave like an island. But how about children who have to get into a taxi and come home and you know they have a grandparent, a grand aunt or whoever, and these are the people who will fall sick. Mm. Mm. So now that the vaccine is taking quite some time and mm. I've, I've been seeing news in the United States and the UK mm. that the latest could be actually December, some people have suggested that actually children missing school is just a worse crisis than the virus itself. Yes. Um, you know, COVID has created a lot of crises. Economic, educational, emotional. Everyday people are on tension. 
the moment you announce somebody has died, especially a high-profile person, everyone gets so agitated and scared. And indeed, we should be worried. However, there's no harm in being cautious. There's no harm in having a watchful waiting. Because, I mean, I compare the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic to the World War II. I wasn't born, but I do know that there was a huge crisis where people did not go to school. So home has become the new school, and parents have to be heavily engaged in ensuring that children are schooling. Would you say that children who are obese or overweight are actually more vulnerable to COVID-19 than those that are not obese? Well, everyone is susceptible to getting COVID-19. However, the people who are likely to get severe disease are the ones with comorbid conditions. And obesity is one of those that has been listed. And, and also, the children who are below the age of six and cannot, or it's not advisable for them to be given a mask to wear, mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 at some point they're going to go out in the communities. What is the best thing to do? And in terms of how to protect them. Are there like baby clothes that can cover their faces or their nose or their mouth? Um, and you know they are very touchy every time they want to touch and eat things, mm -hmm. uh, which means that their hands will get into contact with surfaces, which is really, really dangerous, especially considering how coronavirus spreads. So uh, what is the best method to protect them? You see, um, it's not advisable at all for children below the age of six to wear a mask. And it is up to us, the older people and the children above the age of six, to protect those children. Every time somebody doesn't wear a mask, they are like shooting out uh, moisture and saliva, etc., which could potentially infect those younger children. So it's up to us to protect the little children mm. by wearing our own masks. That, that's the best way to protect them. Yes. And um, the. Some, some of the parents of these children are people who go out in the field to work and then come. Um, I can give you an example myself. I don't have kids yet, but mm. to protect my family members, every time I went to the field and returned home, I would leave my clothes out mm. and maybe, you know, soak them in jeek and I, I washed them myself and I felt that was the most important way to protect my family, even if I wore a mask. But it reached a point when you know, we felt like, okay, this cannot, the mind alone cannot sustain it for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so relaxation came in. Mm -hmm. um, so for the parents who go out to the field to work and have mm -hmm. to return home to their children, um, apart from wearing a mask, what's, what's the best thing? Because you know that the virus can even stick on the cloth. If not washed with mm -hmm. soap or dried out in the sun, the virus can still be there, right? So w what's the other way that parents can protect their own children? Very good question. And you know, studies are ongoing to prove uh, that theory of the virus can stick on doorknobs and clothes and what have you. We know for a fact that the biggest transmission of this virus is through nasal drops. There's no question about it. And that is why people are being encouraged to wear their masks. In places where masks have been worn judiciously, where there's no complacency, that there's been a huge drop in the transmission rates. And as you can see, where there are huge crowds, it's automatic. It's like night and day. When people don't wear masks, the community transmission increases. When people wear masks religiously, and they do social distancing and they avoid crowds, the numbers drop. So for parents who work out there, and I'm one of those, I work in the hospital. When you go back home, your, my children are change agents. They've been taught that when mommy or daddy comes back home, do not give them a hug immediately. You, know, you can see them struggling, you know, with wanting to hug you, but you're like, please don't hug me, let me first wash my hands. And so we must teach our children to be careful, to be cautious. One of my sons will not give me a hug until I've washed my hands. He's like, mommy, wash your hands, wash your hands. He's so serious about that. So it's up to us to teach the children to be change agents, to be the ones to remind us parents. Because when you teach a child something, they are more likely to comply. 
it's easier to teach a young dog tricks than to teach an old dog new tricks. Mm. Mm. And, and lastly, in your own experience as a health worker who has been on the front line, mm. what would you say are the lessons you've learned out of COVID-19 or the new things that you've discovered as a health worker? I have discovered that human beings are complicated. There's a lot of disbelief. Some people have politicized the COVID pandemic, but the truth is there's a lot of um, risk if you're in disbelief that COVID-19 is real. We have so many patients, and I think for us as a country, our curve is climbing. And before we know it, we are going to see a lot of calamities if we do not reboot and rescind our complacency. We need to work hard towards educating the masses, ensuring that people comply to the SOPs. Dr. Sabrina, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. To listen to other episodes of the CoronaCast, visit voxpopuli.ug forward slash podcasts. I'll see you next week. This is the CoronaCast, produced with support from the East African Center for Investigative Reporting.